Oh, hey! Welcome, 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 my lovely lumps. Or should I say lovely labs? I don't know, they're both good. (laughs) I'm so thrilled to have you here in the Labia Lounge to yarn about all things sexuality, womanhood, holistic health, and everything in between. Your legs. (laughs) Oh, Oh, cringe. I couldn't help myself. Anyway, I am your host, Freya Graff, and I am a holistic sex coach and educator and yoni mapping therapist. So basically, I make my living massaging vaginas and teaching people about sex. Yeah, pretty cool. (laughs) So as you can imagine, we are going to have vag loads of real chats with real people about real shit. So buckle up, you're about to receive the sex ed that you'd never had and have a bloody good laugh while you're at it. Before we get stuck in though, I would like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm recording this podcast, the Manang people. It's an absolute privilege to be living and creating dope podcast content on Noongar country and I pay respect to their elders past, present and emerging. Now, if y'all are ready, let's flap and do this. Oh, is there such thing as having too many vagina jokes in the one intro? Whatever. I'm leaving it in. It's my podcast. Don't panic, you're not broken. Your sex education was a piece of shit. Get your flaps out and pull the couch. It's the Lavia Lounge. All right. Today I've got Claire and Luciana, the founders of My ILO, chatting with me today. And I'm so pumped about this because these bad bitches are just all that and a bag of chips and I don't know how old they are I'm gonna ask next but like they look fucking young and they are the co-founders of this like (laughs) epic environmentally conscious sex essential company um and just to give you a little rundown on their ethos They believe that by designing modern and environmentally conscious sex essentials, they can inspire conversation and celebration surrounding self-pleasure. They founded the company on the values of empowerment, education, and environmentalism, as they believe that you should love yourself and it should be done with as much as, as minimal impact on our earth as possible. Because after all, who doesn't love orgasms? Amazing. I just love, I love the kind of vision behind behind this brand and I love what you guys are doing and I'm just yeah so curious about how you got to be doing this and kind of running this fucking awesome sex positive body positive feminine positive business so welcome Claire and Luciana I'm stoked to have you here today Woohoo! hi Freya thanks so much for having us on super exciting we've really been looking forward to having a chat with you Um, Of course, having you on our own Instagram, it's just been so nice to like form a connection with other people in the industry and work together. So yeah, thanks for having us on. Yeah, beautiful. Pleasure treasures. So I'm just going to jump straight in. I mean, my first, my first question that I slotted in there was how old are you guys? You look super young. We're 23. (laughs) 23 years young. 23 years young. Um, we both grew up together. We went to daycare together and we have been best friends forever. And now we've got a business together, <laughs> live together. <laughs> oh um, but yeah, Whoa, live together as well. You guys are just the dream team. I can't believe, I mean, you don't hear about <laughs> friends that have been in one another's lives in that sort of close way pretty much since you know nappy so that's really special I'm so happy for you guys that you've got such a beautiful connection obviously and now you get to have this kind of business and creative outlet together and it obviously works like you guys are just this kind of dream team um, that have complementary skill sets that just kind of seen this business go um, which is amazing lucky to have one another yeah. everyone's always like oh don't go into business with one of your friends like business and partnerships like they don't work but like I literally mm-hmm. couldn't do it without Luch like oh it's the best you share the highs together you share the lows together so yeah it's so nice 
<laughs> oh, epic. It's so nice to hear that. It is such a common thing to have people say, like, don't, don't fuck with, you know, business and friendships or money and friendships or things like that. And, you know, it can go either way. It's the same with, I've got friends that say, oh, I would never live with a close friend, you know, be housemates with a close friend because it does have that risk of potentially uh, rocking the boat of the friendship and then creating tension. But if if you can make it work, then power yeah. to you. That's incredible. Yeah, I think we've made it work. <laughs> <laughs> I reckon so you're making it work. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so give me the rundown on your stories, how you came to be running a business selling sex toys and pleasure products. I know there's a pretty cute little kind of conception story about sitting around at the dinner table talking about masturbation. But if you want to just give me and the listeners a bit of a bit of the lowdown on, yeah, what what's your background and how did you come to be doing this? Um, so my ILO, how is it sparked? Both of us don't come from a background in working in this space at all. I come from a background working in environmental science. I was working for Greenpeace, the charity, and doing environmental regulation. So when we stepped out to do sex toys and start this business, it was never had that intention. Um, the idea for my ILO got sparked, as you said, Freya, over a little girl's dinner that we were having. And two of my girlfriends um, there were talking about being in five-year relationships and they never knew if they'd had an orgasm before. Oh, this was also post I just bought my first ever sex toy, which was, this wasn't long ago. I think like how long, I think maybe two the years very, maybe the idea. The very start of COVID, we, um, it was Marvellous March yeah. and we all decided no boys. <laughs> And we took time for ourselves, <laughs> journaling every day, and we all bought our first um, glass wand. And then mm. after that, it was just like, what is this new world? And then, yeah, yeah Claire <laughs> went to dinner and she had this chat. And, yeah, that's kind of where it was sparked. I yeah, guess. we did do the, the M's. We did, yeah, no men, masturbation and meditation. That yes. was marvellous March. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, so it started and when I was, you know, telling the girls about my overwhelming joy of finding my inner G spot. Um, yeah, that's when this conversation got sparked and my girlfriends were like, I don't know if I've ever had an orgasm before. And I was just sitting there mind blown because I was like, what are you doing being, you know, having sex with a partner for five years and not having an orgasm or not reaching orgasm? Like it's so powerful. And, and then it got brought up about self-pleasure and it ended up like these were like close girlfriends and, it ended up being a really uncomfortable conversation. And I was going, what is going on? Like, why do we as females feel so uncomfortable talking about this? Which then literally spiraled into about three months of us, like me, just researching like, okay, like why is there product, like is it, you know, do we need to start a blog to change this or do we need to do videos or is it to do, is it product-based? And the more and more I looked into the product-based, I was like, no wonder women don't buy it. Like I don't want to go to one of these CD shops and I also don't want to be buying sex toys off that have been marketed using women in like red latex and this whole idea that sex toys are still naughty and promiscuous and all those kind of negative connotations to surround like the sex toy industry and it's just really male-led and really outdated. Um, so yeah, that's when it started. And I was like, Hey, Luch, like one of my many crazy business ideas. What do you reckon about this? And I think it was the first time that Luch actually turned around and she said, Hey, Claire, you know what? I actually think that's a good idea. Like start a COVID. We're not doing anything. We both, we were both back in Margaret river, which is like a country town in Western Australia. And yeah, we were like, started turning like, yeah, from a passion to a business. And we were like, fuck it. We're going to do it. Like, let's just give it a try. Yeah. That's pretty much how ILO originated. And since then, we just hit a year of being live and it's been a whirlwind. But, yeah, it's crazy. We're both doing it full time, quit our jobs, and it's just been really powerful. Like every single feedback or review we get and building such a strong community, it's just like it just drives us to continue to do more because it just makes it all worth it. Mm, incredible. Oh, that's epic. I'm so stoked that you've been having such success and everything's just flowed 
Beautifully because, yeah, I mean, how often do we have business ideas or, I mean, I know I do. I'm constantly having these ideas and then the chance that it actually comes to fruition is pretty slim. Um, And so it's cool that you kind of followed through with this and both of you were like, hey, yeah, like why not? This, this, you know, you saw like a need in that space and even though it wasn't your background I almost feel like people in the environmental space have this like activism streak in them and so maybe that like gave you the get up and go to be like hey I see a problem here this is kind of fucked I don't want dinner conversations around sexuality to be this bloody uncomfortable and confronting so like how can we you know it's so interesting that you were like should we start a blog should we do that like how are we gonna you know affect change in this space which is really really cool I love hearing about people just you know having that fire in their belly and and getting passionate about changing the narrative that you know we kind of just get um brought up in and and don't have a lot of choice in um that's kind of my main my main drive is like oh I don't like the narrative that exists so fuck I may as well do what I can to have some kind of influence on it (laughs) yeah so so true like bringing that up as well Freya like I think that the business my ILO like it really has embodied us like I think the environmental component is definitely you know from my background and from our own personal choices that was a huge thing that we I couldn't find a sex toy company that aligned with my ethics that was a huge one and like Mm. Luke your background as well yeah well I my background is in design actually interiors so it's a bit different to the sex toy world. Um, the interior, but... I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> true. <laughs> yeah, it was just like, you know, why do we want to go to these sex shops where you find these, like, black, purple dildos? It's like, oh, why can't they be something that looks beautiful and we want to display like it's like oh we have to like quickly buy this um buy this sex toy you feel ashamed going into the into the store or walking out with a bag you know and then you hide it away in your bedside table so coming from a background of design it was like okay let's make these products beautiful where we can leave it out and you know feel proud like you know there's no shame about it so yeah I think that's why we wanted our products to like stand out in a different way as well like that huge point of difference yeah I think mm. they almost become like a home decor item to an extent (laughs) which is yeah Yeah. in turn to spark that conversation so like hopefully someone comes over to your house and one of your girlfriends or your partner and they're like oh what's this you know beautiful little thing that you've got here and that sort of is a way that it can segue into that conversation (laughs) because I think that sometimes starting that conversation can be one of the most difficult um elements when you wanting you you are wanting to bring up masturbation and pleasure with it being in a way where it's like relatable and inclusive and easy I suppose yeah yeah mm. even when we were starting it had those conversations with our friends and we're quite an open group so you know it was all fun chats and you know we sampled all the vibrators together and it was just like really like a community sort of collective approach to it but even finding out from our extended friend groups and them saying, you know, this is the first time I spoke about masturbation and pleasure with my close friends is just like wild. And I think that's really what drove our project as well to really get it out yeah. there. Yeah, amazing. It, it, yeah, it is so powerful and potent just to get the conversation started and just to provide I don't know, like a, a that spark or a safe space or some point of interest that might get it happening uh, with people or, or groups that might not be as open naturally because I feel like everyone actually loves talking about sex. They just, like most people fucking love it if you give them yeah. the opportunity <laughs> and they feel safe and comfortable. Yeah. But like a lot of people don't, don't want to be the first to bring it up in case no one else is on board with it or they feel alienated or embarrassed or awkward so it just takes like one person to be brave enough or something like something to spark that conversation before everyone you know before you know it everyone's getting involved in the conversation and your products are very (laughs) elegant like they're they're really different to that usual marketing that you spoke about when it comes to you know raunchy kind of 
saucy sex products that are, you know, that's one that's one vibe and some people are super into that and they really like the, the sort of kinkiness around those like black fucking dildos and whatever. Yeah. Like, you know, then, there's, then there's the other kind of person who might want something a little bit more discreet that blends in with their interior design of the house and that if they leave it lying around, it, you know, it looks beautiful and very classy and sort of sort of uh I don't know there's a real simplicity to your products and the design that you've embraced and that's really cool you know I think it it kind of classes it up a little bit and um yeah my, I was actually gonna you sort of answered me but I was going to ask how, what's your um like product test run like how do you decide what products you're gonna actually launch and then do you like get guinea pigs to test them or do you test them with your you know friends and then come back and swap notes about it or what's the process there oh well well (laughs) it's probably the funnest sampling process you could ever undertake the girls were very happy when we decided with this business idea because they were all very eager to be our guinea pigs yeah I think it was good (laughs) when we started it was just like you need to get so many different samples to really figure out what's going to work what's not and then you know pick the best out of that and then you keep going down it's like what can you change what's going to work better and yeah we um even Claire wrote up a little review sheet of like okay what did you like what didn't you like what color what you know what vibrations it was quite funny so the girls had to fill that out Amazing. Yeah, we had it on rotation between around like 60 girls to begin with and then just increase the sample size, all different ages, all different women, all different, you know, preferences in terms of pleasure as well. We also had a lot of women who had never used vibrators before um, and then lots of women who were really experienced with sex toys as well. So that was that was actually really interesting because I think like what you said before, Freya, about, you know, like it's it's not like there's anything wrong that if you are confident to go and buy like you know a black dildo and you love the kink like absolutely go for it but a lot of our community at ILO is it does encapsulate a lot of people who have never used a vibrator before and have been too daunted and like Mm -hmm. off put to use one Mm -hmm. um including but then also we wanted the products to like kick ass like the products are actually amazing but like even these women who had used a lot of different vibrators could be like oh oh actually this is a huge upgrade (laughs) yeah I think when we're like going through that sampling process as well like all across our Instagram we're constantly asking our community for feedback so you know what would you like do you want an internal vibrator do you prefer clitoral stimulation like um, is it both that you want to be stimulated? So we're constantly getting feedback and then we work through that as well so we can really give our community what they want. Yeah, I think that's important to note, like, because as well, like, Luch and I, like, from our backgrounds, like, we're not specialists in the field. Like, we're not sexologists. We're not sex coaches as well. So I think that we're just really trying to learn and grow alongside our community and really just provide a safe space that we can openly and honestly talk about masturbation and pleasure and we as a, you know, community and business, like we can help support that and create products that allow people to explore that side of them. And, yeah, we've been like so lucky that, you know, to get advice from sexologists and things like that. But, yeah, we're we're so, you know, we're new to it as well and we're like learning as well. So that's been our community on Instagram especially has been really important in shaping our business to becoming what it is to this point. Amazing. Yeah, so cool. I mean, I've got I've got a slightly controversial take on vibrators that's probably not in alignment with um with yours, but I mean, I I love that you've got wands and things available as well because um I uh, hmm, I mean, I don't want this to sound like I'm attacking vibrators or your business, which is based a lot around vibrators, but I definitely um, steer clear of them for myself nowadays just because um, there is a risk of, you know, desensitizing and um, becoming reliant and like really dependent on that vibrator um, to get 
pleasure and like needing more and more and more stimulation uh, and intensity just to get the same level of sensation. Um, so as you know, just cause you were sort of talking about getting feedback and like consulting people about their preferences, like I just want to, um, like put my two cents in and presence the fact that, um, you know, like I think vibrators are so helpful and supportive, especially if people haven't had an orgasm before or they really struggle to surrender and to relax and get out of their heads. And, um, you know, like it's just like the go-to quickest, most accessible, easy way to feel pleasure and get that sort of eros and sexual energy moving and happening. So I recommend them for people as like uh, a sort of first point of contact if they do really struggle to to orgasm or they just really want like um, to experience what it's like to have that super intense peak orgasm and then use it as like a gateway to then start training their body to feel internal pleasure and have internal orgasms on like you were saying you know you had a wand and you experienced a g-spot orgasm so I, I like to just like um I don't know frame vibrators in the larger context as like that's one way and one really powerful pretty fucking reliable way to have an orgasm um but I like to make sure people um know that there is an option to also explore uh wands and dildos and penetration and like nipplegasms and like other ways of um you know, feeling orgasm and pleasure so that we're not just relying on the vibrator every single time. So I love that you've got wands, you've got these amazing like massage candle melt. I feel like is that is that, you know, you burn the candle and it melts into basically like a massage lubricant? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Wow. I think on your last point, quick thing, Freya, about the desensitization, it is such a point of contention, like, between this industry because mm. it's so hard. You have some scholars saying that, you know, it, it's you don't actually, it does, doesn't desensitize your clitoris or it doesn't desensitize you down there because of the fact that it's more you become reliant on a particular way that you're masturbating. Um, but mm. I think that as well that we do stress that, masturbating and self-pleasure with a vibrator and sex with a partner it's so different like it's such a different experience like I feel like it's amazing if you can like use the vibrator learn about how your body works but I I never think that you're ever ever going to be able to find a vibrator that is going to replicate sex in terms of having that overall full body affection touch love Mm. um support safety I think that those sort of things it's it's a really it is a really difficult yeah like difficult topic for us to discuss because yeah it's hard it's hard when you become you have a vibrator and especially in terms of if you are a first-time user and we have a lot of women who've never orgasmed before and they've understand understood their body to the extent to be able to orgasm with one of our vibrators yeah. definitely hard to then in country like apply that to their sexual experience and be able to replicate that feeling um but yeah it's really hard it's like they do destigmatize they don't destigmatize yeah oh, sorry. We, um, <laughs> when we you know a lot of our community does come to us like you said and it's like the they've never had an orgasm before so when we discuss this topic, it's like you're using a vibrator to really just understand your body and how, you know, what masturbation and pleasure is for you. Across our Instagram, we always, always say like, you know, your body does memorise ways of um, feelings of pleasure. So it's so important to mix up your pleasure routine. You know, use a vibrator, use your hands, use the shower head, you know, mm-hmm. pleasure routine and I think just for us, it's about like helping women with that first step of masturbation. Totally. Yeah, totally. And I'm really like, I'm so stoked that, yeah, I mean, you're aware of this, you're open to chatting about it. I was like, oh, should I, like, what should I even say anything? I feel like that (laughs) might seem confrontational or like I've gotten you guys on to just like bad mouth vibrators, (laughs) which is not the case at all. I just am all about like talking openly about all of this stuff and, and putting forward like various different viewpoints and yeah, just providing information. And I, and I love that. Yeah. You're so ready to just have a chat about it, acknowledge those things. Cause yeah, on one hand, I think that, 
um, vibrators can be so empowering in that way. And then there's a there's a flip side where they can be disempowering. And it's just good to be aware of it. It's good yeah. to kind of like, yeah. you know, I've used I've used vibrators. I use vibrators um, on and off for years when I first started self-pleasuring and found that just like so um, I guess like expansive and it showed me what my body was capable of. And I, um, it was really exciting and it was this thing that I did for me and like, I loved it. Um, and then, yeah, again, like you were saying, there's, there's all of the other elements of intimacy and, and pleasure and connection that you can get with like a real person. And then, you know, you can also involve vibrators in, in the bedroom with another person like there's so many ways that you can use these tools and I guess just remembering that they are tools and no one tool is like like the only answer I suppose so yeah thank you for being open to talking about that um and know that you've still got my full support (laughs) support even though I don't (laughs) yeah don't sort of recommend super often like, yeah it's so yeah. so great to hear especially because like you know you you do you are such sex coach as well Freya and you do you know work with people on this so it is yeah. always super interesting I think as well for us like just from like a background business point of view it's really really hard to introduce and make people feel comfortable to the idea of a glass wand mm-hmm. in turn with the idea of a vibrator it's really hard like we have totally. a lot of people and I just know that there's a lot of stigma around them and a lot of people are like, oh, why am I just going to shove this heavy bit of glass? Like that doesn't mm-hmm. make any sense. And it's mm. like really trying to like explain to people exactly how, yeah. you know, to use a glass wand. And it is a lot like it's a much more if I'm using my glass wand, I'm, you know, lighting my massage candle and using my lubes and it's more of a much more process. Whereas I feel like if you have a vibrator, it's a bit more like, you know, you can have a quickie and you can get off, but it feels really good. It's not a lot of effort. Whereas a glass wand, it's really like really like essentially getting to know mm. your body. Mm, totally. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Different strokes for different folks, different tools for different occasions and like, you know, how much time you've got, how much energy you've got. And, you know, that's why I was so like, I think it's super cool that you're educating at the same time you know it's not just a business to like make money and be like well vibrators are popular so like let's get on that it's like clever because yes vibrators already have this reputation as being like a female empowerment tool and this kind of almost like feminist activism-y thing because they you know initially just gave women this this kind of uh autonomy or like sovereignty where they could get you know, pleasure themselves and not worry about, you know, no man, um, which, or they already have that kind of, uh, those connotations attached to them and they're the most marketable, like they're the most popular, super marketable, like people already want them. So you're just providing like a really elegant kind of quality product and then also educating and also providing other tools. And I think it's like sneaking the vegetables into your kid's dinner with like the cheesy, yummy stuff, you know, like... (laughs) have the other product (laughs) it's like we like sort of like they can trust us enough and hopefully our community can trust us enough and we can show them enough that they're like you know what I'll give it a try (laughs) that's really the hope yeah because I think like you know vibrators and clitoral pleasure that is the most accessible quick easy that's like you know the first the first port of call when it comes to exploring pleasure for most people, just because it's, you know, external, it's easy to find, it it feels very sensational quite easily and quickly and vibrators are very well known. And then I guess like you can kind of graduate to more, um, not, I don't want to say like advanced or like put a hierarchy to it, but yeah, I think you're so right in that, like, as you build a brand, as you build a community and you gain that trust and that credibility then people will be more open down the track to being like maybe I'll grab one of those other products that you know these fucking bitches got it's why not like it it could be (laughs) like how it goes down so that's really cool (laughs) um I'm What do your families think about this? In particular, your parents. Like, what do they think? What do they say about the business? How did you like? How did you break it to them? Are they just super open, or has that been a bit of a process? Well, well, I feel like we're very like our families are very open. 
with all this sort of stuff. So, you know, even now at the dinner table, like getting brought up is just like normal for us. At the start, it was probably a little bit, you know, oh, okay, this is new. But like now it's got like my grandma's involved, mum and dad. <laughs> they're just like my mum is probably my, my our biggest customer. Yes. <laughs> so oh, my God. <laughs> Yeah, literally it's crazy but yeah they love it I think it's opened them up as well like it's you know loosened Mm -hmm. them up they talk about it more you know I see mum and dad now and they're just like oh it's almost maybe this little bit of spark um yeah that re-sparked in their relationship um it's been really good dad's pretty funny he um he loves to come up with names for our product (laughs) yeah dear god they're bad (laughs) He wanted to call one a rub and shove. <laughs> oh my god! So yeah, I had that straight no. <laughs> but yeah, that's probably my family, Claire. <laughs> my family. Well, I grew up on a hippie community <laughs> in Western Australia. Um, my mum, I very vividly remember my mum when I was about fourteen. Um, when we were driving back from Perth in a car trip spending the whole time telling me that if I was to, you know, have sex with a man, I had to have an orgasm, like, and self-pleasure, I I had to make sure that I was pleasured and she really emphasised it over that four-hour car trip. So I think when I sparked it to my parents, my mum was like, thought it was the best thing ever. She thought Christmas had come early because she was just like, you know, she, as Luchi's dad was, really wanted to become a part of it. Um, (laughs) But definitely my dad um, was a little bit, my parents are so supportive. Like I'm an only child as well. So they just, you know, just kind of go along with the craziness. Like I've, really lived a bit of a crazy life and I think that they were happy that was more of a business idea instead of like the classic Claire where it's like hey guys I'm like gonna go live in Miami next week or like (laughs) I'm gonna go (laughs) do this or do this so I think that this was like probably a bit more of a mellow idea than that um but yeah definitely definitely when you're like you know meeting a new partner's family um or you're trying Mm. to introduce Ilo to you know, my parents' friends or you definitely get mixed responses. And sometimes, like, I must admit, even me, like, I'm so proud of Ilo and to it is the point now. But over the past year, like, there's definitely a couple of instances where I've been like, oh, I work in environmental regulation still because I just Mm -hmm. haven't had. Or I work in, like, you know, I help people, like, in the sexual health industry, whereas I'm, like, Uh, because I think I just get so scared what these people are going to think and then slowly introduce it. But I'm trying to stop doing that because, like, we're here to normalise it and we're here to celebrate it and, like, everyone does it. So I think it's interesting when you you're around, it's like the conversation could go either way, you know. So, like, when we talk to men, it's straight (laughs) to the business, to the manufacturing, (laughs) to the, like, okay, what did you do to do this? You know, you like all these lists and these boxes you need to tick to start a business, whereas the women are like, oh, my God, no way. And then it's like almost they just want to jump into the conversation because they're like, oh, my God, yeah, it's been opened up. I can yeah, talk about niche? masturbation and pleasure. Yeah, how did you come up with the idea? What have you found in your community? Yeah, that yeah. is such, it is such a difference. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's good conversations. That's the topic sparked. yeah. <laughs> So cool. It is, it's really interesting noticing that contrast. Hey, like just um, the way that like the, our minds work so differently often, like not, you know, I'm generalizing, but often like the way a man's brain works and the first thing he's, things he's going to think of is so much more like practical and rational and maybe more about the business side. And then, yeah, like women are fucking non-linear, like storytelling, you know, like we just, yeah, yeah. it's so different. Um, and that's just epic that your parents are also supportive. I love that. I just adore that. It's like, a, yeah. And, and really cool to hear that, you know, even like, I think it was Luciani, your parents, like you can notice a little bit more spark and it's just, it is so cool that like you, I mean, I feel similarly with like what I do. It's not just a job. Like I'm having an impact. I'm starting conversations that are powerful and potent for people and sometimes provide opportunities for healing and like leveling up your life. And I think that there's nothing more rewarding than that. Um, But I also so relate what you're saying, Claire, about, you know, 
still sometimes just being like, ah, oh, still working, you know, like your old job because it's, especially when it's like a new <laughs> thing, it's pretty, um, yeah, it's, I was actually chatting to someone else on the podcast about this. It's quite vulnerable. And sometimes you just have to pick your battles. Yeah. You just know that like, that's not going to be received in a way that, you know, feels, feels positive or feels empowering for you. And it's going to be a massive drainer. And so I think it's totally okay to just like sidestep that one sometimes. And then I guess like what I was also telling like another guest that I had is I went through that same process and eventually you just get more and more, I don't know, confident and more and more sure footed in like what you're doing, your place in the world, the business is yeah. perfect and like everything like that just kind of comes a lot more naturally and it gets easier and easier to just be like this is what I do this is why I do it get on board or fuck off like yeah. you know <laughs> yeah. that's so true like I think that we've been so blessed like 99% of the people that we tell are so supportive and so interested and you know so accepting of it but there's definitely I think that that you know you're sort of protecting yourself because I know that about one percent you know will be really negative or won't take you you know will treat you differently or won't take any interest like you know I have had yeah a few you know people in our life when I've told them and it's been I don't think that they've ever fully accepted me but I don't think that they've ever fully even come to understand what our business is like they won't give it the time of day Mm, but usually yeah. you know if we find someone who is uncomfortable about the business it's the classic coping mechanism and usually yeah. again like I don't want to stereotype usually this is in men it's the classic like they'll make so many jokes about it because they're so uncomfortable so they can just laugh yeah. it off <laughs> totally there's only been yeah. a few where it's been like yeah a bit of rude, rude remarks yeah but yeah, yeah as I said Freya they can fuck off because mm-hmm. like sucks to be them <laughs> they're lost they're <laughs> lost yeah, they're lost. And like, you're just going to get that, aren't you? Like, you're going to get that with anything, especially in this this kind of industry. Like, it's so triggering for a lot of people. It brings up a lot of trauma. It triggers all of this like deep-seated mm. um, conditioning and like just these, yeah, it's, it's a really complex one. But I think like it just, you know, leave them to it. You might have planted a seed or you might have just fucking triggered them and they're going to like repress that and move on but if that's the case you were never going to have any kind of chance of you know changing their mind or impacting them and they're not your they're not your tribe anyway so I guess it's like more about like protecting yeah, exactly. yourself and your energy I mean this is ha- this is what how I approach it it's like yeah. if I feel like there's an opportunity to plant a seed or if I feel like people might benefit and they're interested they give me the green light or maybe like an orange mm-hmm. light then like cool I'm happy to talk about it but if it's a red light for whatever reason reason it's going to drain me more and it's going to make them uncomfortable and get their back up and it's just not helpful for anyone so I try to sort of avoid that um yeah because it's it is a tough one and it's going to crop crop up yeah Yeah. yes that's so true Mm. um so it is time now for get pregnant and die don't have sex because you will get pregnant and die. Don't, don't have sex in the missionary position. Don't have, don't have sex standing up. Just don't do it. Promise? So, do you have a story for me about how your sex education failed you or an anecdote maybe from someone you know? I mean, yeah, it could be anything really, but... What have you got? Do you want me to go? Yeah, you go first. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, even just, okay, it's hard for me to even remember back to high school and what my sex education was because I feel like there was absolutely none. <laughs> you know, like I, and I think that's where it failed me. <laughs> you totally. know, no one taught me about, you know, female pleasure or even, you know the cycle of your period and there's four phases like it's just mm. so many important things that I know now that were missed and I think that's honestly just where 
you know, failed yeah. me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, it's like obviously Luke and I went to school together as well. So I was the same. Like when we got this question when you sent it over, Freya, we both looked at each other and we we're like, what? I <laughs> genuinely don't think I even had sex education at school. No, you put the condom mm. on the banana and that's about it. I'm like, did we even do that? I did it once. I, did it once. <laughs> I don't know if I even did it. But we ended up, we went to a Christmas dinner last night with all of our friends and we got talking and one of the girls came from a very conservative Catholic school and she said she'd never forget a story one time that they were in class talking about sex education and the teacher said to the class, who watches porn? This is when they were in year, like they were in year 12 and, you know, a few of the boys put their hands up, the ones that were confident enough. And mm. she sent them outside and told them off. <laughs> like actually was, yeah, like actually oh. like split them away from the group, sent them outside and, yeah, it's just, that oh. just blew my mind. I was yeah. like, no way. Like you can't and, be singling out kids like that. Yeah. Absolutely not, mm. especially when they're like, okay, yeah, like I watch porn, which is fine. And then she, mm. like a teacher does that, I think it can yeah. almost like be a bit traumatic for the at that age as yeah. well, like no wonder we have so many issues and trauma surrounding sex. Like at 16, 17 years old, that's going to have a huge effect on your long-term views on this whole opinion and I think it would stop you or like even me personally, like it would have to take a lot for me to feel confident and proud to talk about it again. Oh, my God, totally. That's just fucked. Like, it doesn't surprise me at all, but it does, yeah, it makes me angry and it breaks my heart and it's just, like, not on. Um, And unfortunately, there's a lot of stories like that. I hear so many stories from clients, um, especially of, like, that sort of boomer generation or older. Like, I feel as though things are definitely looking up. But, yeah, it's um, pretty common to hear stories like that. And it's, I mean, that's why I've got this segment to, like, yeah, just be like, hey, so yeah. these things happen and it doesn't mean that they're right or that, you know, they should have the power to alter your entire fucking, you know, sexual identity or your attitudes around this. But, like, they do because it's in your yeah. formative years and something like that can be so damaging. So, yeah, that's a shocker. Um, and, and like, so yeah. what is what has been your relationship to sexuality and to masturbation and pleasure? Like you didn't have much of a sex education. You had to just figure it out on your own. Sounds like you had pretty like dope parents. But, yeah, what's your relationship <laughs> with that and, and where are you at now? Wow. Well, mine was probably like honest, like being honest. Not until we bought our wands in Sydney was I masturbating. Mm -hmm. I just couldn't find, like I tried because I was like, oh, yeah, you know, like I'll try. (laughs) And I just couldn't figure it out. I couldn't find like, you know, my G-spots, what was pleasurable for me. And then, you know, that was what, I'm 23, 21. That's crazy. Yeah, do you know what? I was masturbating until 21. Yeah. And then ever since we started ILO and sampling, I found and discovered my body. So, yeah, I still find that wild even saying that out loud. Mm. <laughs> so I did you? Like, I like, so, I, I always would masturbate but feel really like I was really naughty <laughs> or like I was doing something really wrong and I shouldn't have been doing it. And I felt that for years. And I think I was probably only masturbating like probably, you know, three times a year because I felt like there was still something wrong with what I was doing. And, like, I remember, like, clearly, like, when it got brought up in friendship group conversations and it was like, never have I ever masturbated. And everyone was like, ew, yuck, who masturbates? That's gross. And that was truly, like, it was, like, truly an embarrassing thing. So I think it was, yeah, Yeah. definitely until we got to that point have and we really felt comfortable being yeah. like, you know what? Fuck it. Let's like, there's something powerful here. Why are we, why are we not doing this? Yeah. Totally. Even like, you know, starting ILO, for all of our community, it's like literally, even for us, it's just been like a godsend. Like <laughs> discovering mm. our own bodies has just been like amazing. And I don't think it would have started unless we bought those ones and ILO was sparked. <laughs> yeah. I feel like it sounds mm. like dramatic to a point that it's like, 
it's like the tip of the iceberg, like the way that it's affected like my own personal, physical and emotional well-being has been like unmatched. The ways that, you know, it's increased my confidence, it's increased my communication, especially when I'm with new sexual partners, Um, just being able to understand my body, feeling in touch with my body, feeling connected to my feminine. It's been, yeah, it's really been huge. Such wow. simple things, such powerful mm, Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's incredible. So, like, the first time you even used a vibrator was practically when you were doing, like, sampling for my ILO? Yeah. Yeah, first yeah. time. <laughs> yeah, amazing. I, um... I like totally when you were talking about feeling naughty or yucky or, you know, bringing it up in your friendship group and it just being like, oh, my God, gross. I totally feel that. That was pretty similar (laughs) to me. And I had not even touched my genitals at all besides to wipe and wash until I was probably 20, I think. Um, And there was so much like shame and like repulsion around it. I was super, super grossed out by my own body. And um, I don't know what, I can't even remember like what sort of made me do it or sparked a bit of um, curiosity or gave me, I don't know, the push to actually do something about it. I mean, I remember going to Sexpo in Melbourne um, and maybe it was just like a friend that was like, oh, my God, should we go to Sexpo? How funny. Like, <laughs> and I was like, oh, yeah, cool. Like, oh, my God, how like how naughty um, and how out there. And it fucking was. I saw my first vagina stack. Well, more of a vulva stack, but they called it, what do they call it? A vagina stack or a pussy Ooh. stack or something, which was like a bunch of strippers lying on top of each other um, and then opening their legs. So it was like a <laughs> vertical stack of pussy. Um, and I saw all of these things, like there was all of this kind of kink going on and all this exhibitionism and um, lots of nudity and lots of um, just all the stalls and stuff. And I remember just being like, whoa, oh, my God, like, <laughs> holy <laughs> shit. <laughs> and, yeah, it was like it was pretty daunting. It was a little bit because, like you were saying earlier, like the marketing's pretty raunchy. It's pretty like – Um, can be a little bit, I don't know, like almost vulgar or something. So I was pretty confronted because I was so vanilla nil. I was just like this little fucking innocent thing that, (laughs) you know, thought like sex was gross and, um, you know, bad or whatever. Um, But I ended up buying like a rabbit, like vibrator dildo combo thing. So it's like a dildo with like uh, that goes inside you and then like the little rabbit like ears that vibrate on your clit. And um, yeah, holy fuck! <laughs> I like opened up <laughs> a whole new world. And um, and I remember like after that, I was like, okay, so like you know, now now I'm like masturbating, I'm touching myself, all right. But I still felt kind of guilty and weird. And then when I did like I don't know, I ran out of batteries or something, or I wanted to like explore with my fingers. I would put glad wrap around my fingers because I was so repulsed by my own body and my genitals. And I thought it was so yucky to touch, you know, my wet bits that I would like either slip a condom over my fingers or like put glad wrap around my fingers. Um, And that's just like, yeah, it's, it's just speaking to that, that, that shame and that like sort of self-loathing, like, like body negativity, I guess. Um, and yeah, it's it's interesting. Like I love that you were highlighting how much your confidence has changed, the way you move in the world, the way you relate, to, you know, with new people, the way you communicate about your needs. Like that's that's the shit. That's the shit that I coach and educate about. It's like sexuality is such a sort of holistic thing, and it doesn't just affect you in the bedroom. It affects you out there in the world and in day to day life. And so I can't speak highly enough for, yeah, exploring yourself, creating a, you know, deeper connection with your body and your sexual energy and um, just, yeah, getting as familiar as possible with, with your genitals. And I think sex toys are a really good, like fun, kind of exciting, accessible way to start that, Um, you know, if you need that little extra motivation or excuse I suppose um yeah thank you for sharing yeah, all of that. yeah. <laughs> 
Um, and so I'm curious because I, you know, had I had a lot of shame. I had a lot of conditioning around this stuff. And I know for me, it was a pretty big deal to go public with like what I do. Um, did you have to overcome much like conditioned shame around all of this in order to like, you know, go public with the business and start talking openly in groups and things like that? Or were you kind of just like, in in the deep end like let's do this I think for me personally I have always been like a very much like if you don't like me or you don't like what I'm about like then like fuck off like it it's Mm -hmm. not going to affect me but I even think like the night that we launched ILO like of course we've been talking about it with so many people around us for so long before that there was definitely a part of me on my Instagram still. I was like, oh, fuck, like it's going live. Like people are really going to see what we've been working on for the past, like, you know, year. But mm-hmm. I think at the same time, it we were so proud of what, what we were doing and we were so proud of the message that we were sending and we were so proud of the change that we would be making that it was like that excitement and nervousness. Yeah, it trumped mm-hmm. you know, what, who cares what other people think. And because we were you know, the whole process of starting ILO at the start, we had so many of those conversations with different groups of people, which I think, you know, made us, you know, more confident in what we were like, you know, developing. And so when it did launch, you know, there's that tiny, like closer, that tiny bit of like, well, it's going live. But at the same time, you know, look how far we've come in our own sexual journeys. So like, we can't wait for other women to, you know, jump on board. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's yeah, definitely. there's a big difference between um having conversations in person with people and being able to gauge their reaction, being able to like approach it only when you feel like safe safe that it's going to be received well and then like chucking something online is like a whole other thing and that is fucking terrifying. Yeah. Um so good on you because yeah, I guess obviously like the proudness or pride that you felt and like the work you put in and the positive feedback you'd received in real life was enough to like push you yeah out of your comfort zone when going live online so I'm really stoked for you it seems like it's going so well as as well so that's incredible um and Thanks, like I, <laughs> yeah um no worries um <laughs> What about your dating lives? Because I re- like I have experienced a lot of different reactions. You just sort of touched upon, you know, being with a new sexual partner or like talking to someone that you are starting to date about it. And yeah, I get such a varied reaction. Um, I remember when I was like in the dating pool <laughs> or the dating world. Um, it was a really interesting, like almost like a pivotal point, like seeing how someone received like what I do and like, you know, obviously being a pretty sexually empowered, like confident woman can go either way. Like you could get dudes who are really emasculated or intimidated by this or people that are like all about it or people that like kind of fetishize it and are like, oh, that's so fucking hot. Oh my God. So like, what are you, like, what are you, how do you guys, um, yeah. What do you get in your dating lives? Oh, I think there's been a fair mix. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Like I have, um, on tinder and he just said the most bizarre thing i was he's i can't remember exactly word for word but it was you finally come on to conversation of like what i do and he made some comments of like oh does that like negatively impact your relationships with people and i was like excuse me <laughs> it's just i think you know yeah like is he being like almost you know because he, maybe he sees it in like an emasculating way or He's just confronted with his own, like, you know, was that a trigger for him? But mm. that was that was interesting. That was the, probably mm. the only really negative one that I've ever had. Most other men are very open to it and they're like, oh, no way, you know, very much the business side first. But when you start to talk mm-hmm. about it, you know, they even want to jump on board with their sexual journeys, you know. I feel yeah, like lots of guys true. do want to chat about it as well. So, you know, that's cool. almost that gateway into that open conversation for both of us. Mm. Yeah. 
Um, my sexual experiences. Well, I actually broke up with my partner yesterday. Oh, <laughs> so babe. Funny, but, <laughs> <laughs> but we were together for most of ILO since it had been launched. He was always like so accepting and so open and it was really new for him as well. So I think it was a bit exciting. Um, he was more like, you know, he definitely found it where he was like, oh, I get a little bit uncomfortable when people ask me what you do, like at the very start, um, mm. like when it was like his parents, friends and things like that and like his aunties and his grandparents and stuff. That was definitely mm. his only point was he was a bit like, oh. Um, but as long as the longer our relationship went on in terms of that, it got easier, of course, because you just get used to it. But before we were together, oh, I had a really big mix of responses. I had like two boys I was sleeping with in a row who were like, they saw me as like this sacred teacher. <laughs> and it was like <laughs> such a weird experience because it was like we'd have sex and they'd be like so what what does this feel good or did, what was I doing right what was I doing wrong what could I improve on what was this it's like you get this like they think that because you're like experienced in the sex toy industry like you're like yeah like you're got all expert. yeah you're an <laughs> expert which is like I'm like must admit like, I'm very like I'm probably um on the more conservative side I'm a very like loving sexual person so that was always a very big adjustment and I also you know it is that pre idea that I've had a few men say like oh I thought you'd be more kinky like I thought you would be a bit more like promiscuous and I think that is that deep rooted thing of like you know sex toys and that idea of them being like yeah promiscuous and naughty and everything definitely I saw that coming through in sexual partners mm. um yeah when they knew what we did that was that totally. actually was a huge one before but, but or like the I had I did have actually one man as well and it was that classic like um yeah feeling a little bit like demasculated from it and being like oh I'm going to be better than the vibrator or I'm going to show you that I'm better or I can pleasure yeah. you better. And then yeah. that was a real conflict because it was like he wasn't actually up, like listening to what how what I actually liked and being able to let me guide him because it yeah. was like he wanted to, you know, that was Totally. Well. Yeah, totally. That's a pretty yeah. common, common thing, I think, um, you know, like, uh, I, I guess men attaching their ego to their like ability to please a woman or their sexual prowess and like feeling like it's their yeah. job and their responsibility and like really attached to their manlyhood, you know, the ability to like give you an orgasm or like provide you with this like experience. And, and often they get so in their head about it that one, they're not listening to you. They're just trying to fucking like do all the moves and, yeah. you know, they're so yeah. focused on getting this result so they will feel good and like a king dick that they totally leave you behind and practically leave you out of it really yeah. um or they get in their heads and feel inadequate and insecure and overthinky and then their boner goes away and then they feel even more shit and it's just this vicious cycle yeah. of like total emasculation and disempowerment and then you're afraid to speak up because and guide or sort of offer suggestions or feedback because then they're going to be even more overthinking and even more insecure and yeah everyone's just like yeah it's a really complex thing and like I you know I talk about it with a lot of people in my work and I coach men as well so I'm kind of hearing their side of it as well but I know like personally mm -hmm. I used to come up against this situation where like people guys would be like oh well like you literally massage vaginas for a living and you're like a fucking pussy expert mm -hmm. so like holy shit how am I ever gonna <laughs> You must be scrutinizing every single thing I do. Yeah. You know, you must be like yeah, paying attention. That's so true. Yeah, and it was like it sucks because yeah. I totally understand where they're coming from. Like sometimes I would be, you know, with these like tantric gods who who like run international <laughs> tantric <laughs> schools and you know like heaps kind of older and more experienced than me when I was first starting out and I would just be like oh my god oh my god oh my god I can't believe I'm like with this person mm -hmm. I'd put them on this pedestal and I'd be like <laughs> so self-conscious and so like nervous and just worried that they were gonna I guess judge like my 
I don't know, sex ability or skills or whatever. And it's not a nice feeling. It puts you in your head and out of your body. And then you're like doubting yourself and it kind of takes you out of that like beautiful flow that ideally you could get into when you're, you know, love making. Um, and, and I just used to have a bit of trouble, like trying to impress upon dudes and like reassure them, like, I'm actually not like, I'm not scrutinizing everything you do. I'm not paying heaps of attention and taking notes and being like, oh my God, like I would do that this way. Or like, yeah. you, you know, you're not doing yeah. it right. Yeah. Because like, yeah. I fucking understand, like I have compassion. I'm not an absolute bitch for starters, but also like, it's not even about the moves or what they're doing. It's more about, you yeah. know, their presence yeah. and like how they make me feel in their presence and yeah. the eye contact and the like energy and just the intention because like I love hearing that you've, you know, you've been with a couple of guys. I think Claire you were saying that we're just like, okay, so like what felt good? What can I do better? What do you prefer? Like awesome, you know, they just want to please you and they want to learn. And so I'm just on board for like sex to be an opportunity to learn and to grow and to adapt yeah. and calibrate to one another. And so, yeah, it was like a little bit of a struggle sometimes when people would kind of have me on this pedestal as like this yoni goddess that knows everything and like, you know, oh my God. And that thing you were saying about people being like, oh, I thought you'd be more kinky. Fucking hell. I've gotten that so yeah. much. Like this, the amount of pressure yeah. that there is on someone working in the sexuality industry to be this like fucking full power kinkster, like bad bitch. <laughs> like I, I just, I'm so, I'm so vanilla. Like I, I'm all about that. Yeah. Like felt like love connection slow love making like you know that gets me going I don't have yeah, any particular yeah. kinks or like you know I'm not like crazy I'm super open-minded but I just like naturally don't have any major like um kinks that that get me going and like I, I love talking about them I'm fascinated by it I like I, I fucking wish I did wouldn't that be more exciting but you know I'm just yeah. I am the way I am and I'm more about yeah the connection and the love and slowness and um it was a bit of a it was a bummer it would feel like you know then I would feel inadequate like I wasn't living up to the expectations of this like super sexually explorative like wild minx and that's just yeah we yeah. just over sexualize everything because just because I work in the sex sexuality space doesn't mean necessarily that I'm a fucking nympho that yeah, yeah. That. <laughs> I think yeah. you're so right as well Freya like when you're talking about it as well it's like you've also like I've also got to like or even for me like now starting to see sexual partners again I think it's like not letting it affect your own like self-confidence and self-value in terms of like trying to like live up to I suppose some of these expectations that you think people have set so I feel like it takes you out of the present when you're with someone because you're like, oh, are they expecting me to be this way or are they expecting me to act like this? Did they not think that I was good? Like it's all to that sort of that mm. classic thoughts that you used to have as well. So mm -hmm. it's like trying to balance, yeah, balance all of that energy and just be like, hey, I'm a human. Some things I like I might not be know what I'm doing like help tell me tips and hints as well. Mm -hmm. Like I'm the same as you like self-pleasure is as we said at the start like self-pleasure and sex like definitely go hand in hand but they're still different experiences mm, yeah it's like maybe it's, you're you're great at self-pleasuring yourself but it doesn't mean that like maybe you you know you might still need some direction during sex and that's like so healthy and so right yeah, and, you know, you can be super experienced and super, like, book book read and whatever. Like, I, you know, I nerd out on sexuality. I've been working in this space for years and it's my jam. But, like, you know, I could still find myself in a position where I don't have all the answers or I don't know what's going on and I'm a bit, like, you know, just getting in my head or spiralling and, like, that still fucking happens. You know, I'm not above that. Yeah. I haven't, like, you know, gotten to the point where I'm, like, totally immune to all of that. That shit's human and especially if you're with a new person where like you haven't sussed each other out yet, you haven't calibrated, you haven't had like heaps of conversations and, and experimentation with one another to like, 
you know, know one another's bodies and get your communication on point. And like, then, you know, you're inevitably going to come up against situations where, yeah, you're both a little bit clueless or you might be getting a little bit, um, overthinky or insecure. And, you know, I think it's just important to like acknowledge that and talk about it and be like, that's okay. That's going to happen. And it doesn't mean anything negative. It's just the reality and the less, um, we can beat ourselves up about it, the better. And then that kind of creates a really supportive, safe environment where like, you know, maybe next time it it might be like, you're having a bit of trouble and you're like, oh fuck, sorry. I'm just like really in my head. I'm getting kind of like, you know, a bit like a bit of negative self-talk about myself and I'm starting to like overthink this. And then the next time, like it might happen to him and he'll, he'll then feel safe to be like, oh my God, sorry, babe. Like, that thing's happening and like now my bone is gone (laughs) and like it's nothing to do with you just this happens and it's just this like environment of like total acceptance and love and compassion for one another and for ourselves um yeah and I I really want to encourage that because like this shit happens you know Mm -hmm. yeah Yeah, communication is key (laughs) yeah big time big time um, speaking of communication, I want to communicate about some TMI. TMI, we love it. TMI, we love it. So, do you guys have a TMI story for me? Um, just like a little for the for the listeners. I haven't just sprung this on them. I did like word them up beforehand, and you know, if if you don't want to participate in this segment, it's like so fine. But if people have a story that is kind of usually like considered too much information for public consumption, this is the place where I want to talk about it. I want to shine some light on it. I want to hear some juicy shit. I want to hear some vulnerable shit. I want to hear some funny shit. Whatever you've got, if it's usually considered TMI, this is the place to talk about it. Um, so. What do you get? Well, um, yeah, thinking about this one because, you know, like I'm similar to like you guys, like I like, you know, a bit more slow, passionate sex. Like sometimes, you know, fun is great, you know, a bit more hot and spicy. But so just thinking about my own, there's got to be one time and I know it's happened to lots of people out there is the good old accidental anal. (laughs) That's mine. Um, Yeah, it is painful. Oh, my God. I don't know. Someone needs to pre-warn you about that. Just be careful because it's so painful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when it... I feel like we've all been there when it just accidentally oh. just misses the wrong oh. spot and you feel like you've had a dagger go through your oh. body it's just come up the wrong way. And it's like, but then, you know, even after, because, you know, mine was with someone that was just a, like, one-night stand and it's like oh my god like fuck like you know do I pull myself together or do I you know do we keep going but it was so so that I'm just like I'm so sorry we have to stop (laughs) good on you good on you it's funny like when you bring it up too it's like yeah like oh my god this one time and then like half of the other room is like oh my god I had that too (laughs) Mm-hmm. Yeah, anal yeah. when you're not ready for anal is oh. frightening. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> frightening. <laughs> yeah. Oh, totally. <laughs> yeah, it's a fucking nightmare. That's just um, I've heard I've I actually don't think that's happened to me. Surprisingly, I tend to like if if wow, someone wow. if a guy's like going um with that whole kind of like in and out sex where they're like pulling the penis practically all the way out and then thrusting it back in again. I'm just like, ah, uh, 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 like fucking stop that. I do not like that. That is like, yeah. that feels good. <laughs> but it doesn't feel good for a vag. I'm telling you, like get in deep and grind and like, let me do my thing. But like, if you're like pulling it all the way <laughs> yeah. out and then, like shoving it all the way back in enough that it could slip out and get all, oh, then like, no, no yeah. thanks. <laughs> yeah, it's bad. <laughs> yeah, that's bad. It's bad. I feel like it's always like, you know, when you're very, like, you're starting to have sex and you're really un- inexperienced or like it's a drunk oh, night and yeah. it's a mess. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and it's a mess. Totally. <laughs> yeah. And you haven't, like, you know, gone down that path of, like, you know, um, you know, uh, pleasuring yourself anally. So it's like you just don't know and then it happens and then it's just, it's 
it's end over. It's game over. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Nice good on you over. for yeah. calling it. Good on you for just being like, whoa, okay, like we got to stop. Because like very sadly, <laughs> a lot of women wouldn't feel comfortable to do that and they would just push through and keep going until the guy had like done his thing and finished. And like, I really want to, I want to change that, you know, as like a, a normal thing yeah. because yeah, yeah that's yeah. shit time. Speak up. Yeah. Yeah. Big time. Um, My TMI. Do you know what? I usually am like really open with everything. And I was like, what am I going to do for this segment? But I have just thought of the perfect one. Um, yes. For me personally, I had the Marina put in about a year ago mm. and it's not every time I have sex, but it'll be certain points of the month that I think it's when I'm like, because I, I have the marina because I have endometriosis and they said it's one of the best fixes to it and because of contraception as well. But it's been when, like at certain times of the month, probably when my natural cycle I'm meant to have my period, I will bleed and I won't. Even like it, it's one of those ones where you, because you don't have any symptoms and you haven't bled like before or anything, like you don't realize that you're bleeding. So I think that that's been one for me that, you know, I'm like, is this normal? Is it not normal? But I have had a lot of girlfriends and I did seek medical advice and they're like, no, that's just, you know, almost like an overflow kind of a situation. So I think that's one that we should definitely talk about because I was literally like, oh my goodness, is there something seriously wrong with me here? <laughs> but yeah, bleeding during sex. <laughs> Mm, oh, oh, during sex. Okay. I don't know if you meant, I was like, hang on a second. What are we talking about? Okay. Oh, so sorry, you bleed sorry. during sex. Yeah. 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 Um, yes, yeah. Sex, but yeah. My mirror, because of it hitting my mirror, you know, yeah, like totally. Maybe it's just like the way that the marine is positioned at that point, but yeah, that's probably. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, I'm not an expert, but I feel like um, from all the like research I've done on marinas and IUDs and just chatting to people, it's probably more likely that it's actually um, like aggravating. Like if the um, dick hits it and it kind of jostles it around a little bit, it might aggravate mm -hmm. and cause a bit yeah. of bleeding because like the cervix is so, 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 um, how do you say it? like capillarized? I don't know if that's a word, but there's so yeah. much. <laughs> Yeah, blood flow, lots of capillaries and very, very, very fine, like thin, tiny ones that like burst really easily and bleed really easily. Um, yeah. Like, yeah, it's it's quite easy to make it um, bleed. And so I feel like when there's something in there um, that's already kind of positioned, you know, in this place and it's causing irritation um, and inflammation, then like to bang it around a little bit might cause a little bit of like abrasiveness um and make it bleed I feel like that's yeah. quite a common thing to to happen I've got a few friends with IUDs and they they get a bit of that going on as well is it sore does it hurt no you can't feel it that's why I think it's always like a little bit of a shock to a sense because you just like you know you feel like you're really like turned on and you're really enjoying the sexual experience and then mm. yeah you realize that it's actually bleeding quite heavily from it so mm. yeah and I think with different yeah. people different people respond to blood differently you know mm. it can be like you know some some people might be like oh you know don't deal with it really well and it can just completely ruin the experience or you know others can be quite supportive I think it just depends on mm. yeah definitely totally like that's it's it's like that you know with period sex it's sometimes uh, not not some people are not on board with it, um, you know, both genders or all genders. But, yeah, it's um, something that I've kind of relished. Have, I really enjoy having a partner that's not fussed about it, um, about blood, I mean. And, you know, if you have sex when you've got your period, it's no biggie. You know they're not going to be squeamish or grossed out. And I'm not saying it's, like, not okay to be squeamish or grossed out by blood, um, but it's pretty relaxing being with someone who's just, like, so not – not phased by it and then you know if we do have sex when I've got my period and um when we're like about to when when I've kind of finished up and I'm about to like hop off him it's always a bit like oh here we go the floodgates are open <laughs> yeah. on, like you know depending yeah. on if he's come That's inside funny. me yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, that can yeah. be a bit of um, a bit of a gush, a bit of a like <laughs> sort of. Yeah. Um, yeah. It yeah. is always that classic, like, uh oh, here we go, like yeah. the moment's over, and now we've got and a big clean it up. up. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Like I call it the um the come run. Like this is like not even blood specific, but just if they have come inside you, like getting off, like cupping your vulva like immediately and then like cupping yeah, oh it while God, you run to the toilet. The <laughs> yeah, the come run. And then, oh my um, goodness. Why is that not normalized? Because I'm like all these women in movies, they just roll oh, yeah. over and have a beautiful sleep. And it's like you would literally be just sitting in a puddle right yeah. now. It's like oh, ripping your out. bed sheets <laughs> need washing. <laughs> I think that every time. Like I cannot watch sex scenes now without it just being so ruined for me because, like, firstly, I'm just like, okay, well, for fuck's sake, like, where's the foreplay? She's not ready. Like, that's not how you have sex. She's orgasming yeah. in 30 yeah. seconds. Like, what the fuck? And then afterwards I just roll over and then fucking, yeah, I'm just like, you're in a puddle of jizz. Like, that's, you got to at least go pee yeah. so you don't get a UTI. <laughs> Bye. 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 And like, yeah, what that yeah. shit? Yeah, you know? one. <laughs> yeah. Oh god. Yeah, and then the <laughs> other thing that I do, especially when there's been um, when I've when I've got my period, is like I will like wrap my legs around him and just kind of koala bear onto him with his dick still inside me, and he'll stand up and carry me to the shower, and then we'll like like separate genitals <laughs> once I'm over, you know, like the bathtub. <laughs> Freya, what a man. Where where did you find him? I know. Oh, tell me about it. Like you have no fucking idea. Oh, he's just he's so down. He's so down. Like we do this is like this is my TMI. Um, but we like when I first started um dating him, we like um oh actually I can't remember if, he, if he's on board with me telling this story I should probably I should probably chill out anyway maybe I'll check in maybe that'll be for another episode but yeah he's a fucking legend basically yeah, we'll be listening. <laughs> we'll be like, I'm like I don't know his family yeah. might listen his his parents I think he's a little bit like oh I don't know he's so on board with he's so fucking supportive and he's just like yeah unbelievably encouraging but I think it is a little bit like I'm so comfortable in public about this stuff but like I can't expect him to be that same level of totally yeah. like footloose and fancy free because yeah like maybe he doesn't want me sharing intimate details of our sex life and his fucking mum listening to it or something so anyway um yeah. that's enough of that so just before we wrap up because I'm just conscious of time here um, what is like, what's something really surprising or interesting that you've learned along the way through working in the sexuality space, um, that you like wish that you'd known about sooner? Oh. We've learned, honestly, there's stuff every single day, every time mm. we put the polls up, because we do, we do like a segment on our Instagram called let's talk. And it's like a really open form platform that we let our community contribute and we try to provide our own educational resources or perspectives on different topics, everything from ranging from like porn to um, libido. Yeah, libido. Oh, so there's literally so many of them. You just got to jump onto our Instagram and have a look. (laughs) Um, But that has definitely been the biggest teacher for me. I think like... Definitely, I think I was really blown away by how many women in our community had never reached orgasm before. I think Mm. I always knew, I think I always knew it was like an issue, but I don't think that, I think I was really overwhelmed by the actual amount of women who were coming to us and were saying, you know, what product do you recommend? I've never had an orgasm before. I really, you know, want to learn my body. Or in turn, like we had a woman the other day send us in a review, like anonymously, and we, we were just like, oh, wow. And she was in her late 50s and she'd been with a partner her whole life and she'd just gone through a divorce. And using our ILO products was the first time that she had been able to, like, give herself an orgasm herself. Mm. That yeah. was, like, super. Amazing. I was just like, wow. I think yeah. that's the biggest one. It's, like, the mothers out there, the older women coming to us and telling us, and, you know, we're like, oh, 21 and I've discovered masturbation and then we hear those stories and it's like, wow, 
it's just so crazy all these different generations of like just not experiencing or not you know being educated about pleasure Mm, that was surprising yeah and I think that sort of like segues into like you know our biggest challenges with ILO like you know, it's being our biggest challenge at the moment is actually being able to reach people. Like we're blocked from everything. We're blocked from, I think this was a big teaching for us. Like before we started ILO was, I think we went really naive into being like, yeah, we can, you know, promote all through the normal traditional marketing mechanisms. Like we can do Instagram ads, we can do Facebook ads, like we can do all of that. Whereas we're literally blocked on like everything <laughs> mm, so it's yeah. really hard to actually reach people to educate people in the first place and especially as well like in the industry going against like with how quickly it's grown this year because it was like sort of like when we launched ILO like it wasn't really a movement and now it has been which of course to us is like a huge advantage and it is definitely you know bringing masturbation and pleasure to the surface, even with like podcasts like this, Freya, like I feel like it was really unheard of. Um, But, you know, it comes with the challenges as well that like we're facing like multi-million dollar businesses here and like Mm. we're just the little one who, you know, we just self-funded this ourselves. Um, And it's sometimes like, you know, we obviously like purchase a lot of our competitors' products to sample them, but it's even like, seeing seeing them run by a big business and like the amount of packaging and just no sort of like the environmental standpoint I think that's like the huge worrying thing for me personally because it's like number one that from that side of it it's like wow how is this still happening but number two like how how are we like a lot of this informational education like can be really detrimental to women but they've sort of packaged it in this same notion Mm. of like you know, women-led, female-led company and you come to find out that it's two men who run it. <laughs> and, oh. like, it's like the background, you know, it's like that background is just not there. So I think that's been like a major, like different from our sort of like community teachings but a huge teaching mm. for us and like young women in business um, and probably mm. one of our biggest challenges in this sort of sexual industry as well. Yeah. Oh, my anyone- God. Yeah. Like I said to Luke the other day, I literally feel like my job is just like I'm literally a fire extinguisher and I put out fires. Like I'm just like always like it's just hump after hump after hump. But, Mm, you know, we're just trying to like, you know, stick to what we do and like why we're doing it and remembering our mission and like, you know, it was never meant to be a business. So like how thankful we are that this can support our lifestyle and like support our life and like hopefully – you know, women can see themselves in us and feel represented and feel like we're relatable. And I think it's like, yeah, they can enjoy ILO from browsing to purchasing to using. Like that's our aim and we can do it without as minimal impact on the earth as possible. Yeah, incredible. Yeah, I I am um, <laughs> I feel you on the like censorship and being blocked and banned and it is just like constantly pushing shit uphill and I I feel that like I'm banging my head against a brick wall a lot of the time just trying to get past all the red tape and the bureaucracy and the like um yeah it's it's a very very disheartening reality of working in the space and yeah, I feel like I'm I'm doing the same thing as you. Like I'm just trying to keep coming back to my vision and reminding myself of like why I'm doing it, why it's important, you know, that the squeaky wheel gets the oil. Like I just have to keep going and keep plugging away. And even if like, you know, I just help one or two people here and there, then that will have a ripple effect. And yeah, I think um, yeah. like – just amazing and tenacious of you to keep going even though you're constantly putting out spot fires and hitting roadblocks um like the fact that you've gotten to the place where you have already is huge and so admirable and a lot of people would probably have and probably like people have you know set out on that path and then given up because it like they make it so fucking hard um to succeed and yes. yeah, yeah up oh, against it so good it's fucking like on 22 you. Of like <laughs> it's that catch 22 of like you need you want to be proud of what you're sharing but then you're censored so then it's like oh 
you know, you've got these posts have to be, you know, not exactly what we want them to be, but they have to be censored so we can reach all these women out there. It's like, oh, oh balance. Yeah. And then still yeah. most of the time we can't reach yeah. these women. It's so yeah. hard. Yeah, it's so frustrating. Yeah. Like I've got that real um, inner conflict where I want to be out and proud and like representing this kind of shame-free, unapologetic um, empowered stance when it comes to sexuality and pleasure and feminism. But then I'm finding myself fucking spending like 10 extra minutes on every Instagram post, changing the spelling of like yeah. words that are going to get censored and yeah. like ch- altering like, stuff. Like sex. Yeah. Oh God. It's, it's fucked. Yeah. It's a nightmare. Yeah. It is fucked. It's like, it's literally like, as we were talking earlier on in the podcast, like you find like 99% of people are so comfortable and open and interested and wanting to learn and wanting to explore this space. But then you go on to Instagram and Facebook and all these like, you know, mainstream platforms. And it's like, you feel like you're back in the like dark ages like it's yeah. so so backwards it is wild mm. it is so wild it's like it you is, feel like it? maybe what you are doing is maybe even wrong to an extent because it's like you are so heavily blocked mm. yeah totally it's yeah oh, fuck I could rave about it endlessly but um I feel like yeah. we get it anyone that's listening to this gets it that's why you know I've got a podcast yeah. so I can swear and talk about like sex yeah. and pussy as much as I want and then get that TMI conversation happening and hopefully people find this relatable and inspiring and you know supportive in their journey to release all the shame that we're constantly getting like reinforced by things like the censorship um you know regulations and stuff on all those mainstream platforms so I I want to encourage people to follow your page get involved in the um is it called let's talk segments yeah yeah let's talk let's talk about our stories yeah yeah so you know that's educational they're interviewing lots of cool people about all things sexuality and you know womanhood and um check out check out my ILO and the products um I would love to try one of those candles that's a new concept to me that's such a cool idea (laughs) um yeah my favorite product (laughs) amazing well thank you so much beautifuls it's been an absolute pleasure I've just adored talking to you and I think it's super cool that you're out in the world doing this shit and at such a young age that's really 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 impressive so yeah I'm really grateful to you for coming and chatting on the labia lounge today thank thank you you so much for having us Freya and yeah our instagram's my m-y-i-l-o dot a-u Beautiful. I'll chuck those links <laughs> in the, um, in the sh- <laughs> I'll put those links in the show notes. Don't worry about that. <laughs> All right. See Beautiful. you later, everybody. Thank you so and that's it, darling hearts. Thank you for stopping by the Labia Lounge. Your bum groove in the couch will be right where you left it, just waiting for you to sink back in for some more double L action next time. And in the meantime, if you'd be a dear and subscribe, share this episode, or leave a review on iTunes, then you can pat yourself on the snatch because that, my dear, is a downright act of sex-positive feminist activism. And you'd be supporting my vision to educate, empower, demystify, and destigmatize with this here podcast. Also, I'm always open to feedback, topic ideas that you'd love to hear covered, or guest suggestions. So feel free to get in touch via my website at freyagraph.com or say hey over on Insta. My handle is Freya underscore graph underscore YMT and I seriously hope you're following me on there because damn, we have fun. We have fun. Anyway, later labial legends. I'll see you next time.